Good morning, everybody. This really has me excited for a lot of reasons. Uh, I love our Four Corners offering, the way that we remember the poor every week, but to empower women, not just to give a hand out, but a hand up in developing countries, give them training and education. Uh, it's, it's really a kingdom thing, you know what I mean by that? That's like something Jesus would do and send us to do in our world today. So very excited to be giving to that in our Four Corners offering. But uh, hey, you know, I'm learning stuff all the time. I know I'm not that old, but I just feel like the world keeps getting opened to me. You know what I learned this week? I learned you can wash slippers in the washing machine. It never really occurred to me that this was something that people did or I could do. Uh, but uh, my wife and I were sitting on the couch. I had my slippers on. And all of a sudden, she, she like makes this noise. <laughs> I was like... What is it? Your feet. I was like, well, I guess I either have to throw away these slippers, which I don't want to do because I like them. You know, they're soft and warm, like good slippers should be. Or I can wash them and see what happens. And it's the craziest thing, guys. They came out smelling nice. They came out clean. It's, you know, we wash our socks after every wear, or at least most of us do uh, most of the time. Uh, but I, it never occurred to me that you could do that with your slippers. And one of the interesting things to me about that and how this applies is Allison can smell things that I can't smell. Uh, it might be in part that she is pregnant and things are heightened for her, but uh, it's true all the time. She can smell things that I can't smell. And it's not just like bad or ugly smells. Uh, she can smell and taste uh, like the beauty of something or, or the, the extravagant taste of something that I don't always smell. And I think that's probably true for other people in this room, not just because you have an advanced taste of smell, taste of smell, uh, <laughs> sense of smell, but you know, some of you can taste things that I wouldn't be able to taste. Like Ed, who is a trained sommelier, can taste wine at a level that I don't understand. Um, I'm looking around here, we have some musicians here sitting in the inner circle, right? When they listen to music, they can hear things that I don't hear. They can hear what the bass player's doing. They can hear what the drummer's doing. They can hear, you know, the difference between a violin and a viola and a cello and how those things maybe interrelate. And that's, I think, a little bit how beauty works, where depending on our experiences, depending on what we know and the level of depth that we know something, we can actually engage at a, at a deeper level or at a heart level. And so we're in this series uh, that's brand new today called Beauty and Truth. And I'm really, I'm excited about this. Uh, I think God is doing something beautiful in this church. I'm talking about you guys. Uh, beautiful like the Dutch mess that I made for the global potluck today. Can we put that up? Doesn't that look good? It's bacon and potatoes and arugula and some other things. But it's, uh, it's like this beautiful mess, right? And I look around this room, and one of the cool things I think about being in the circle is you can see each other. And a lot of us are coming in with like messy lives. Uh, maybe we've messed up recently, or maybe we're coming in with, with a deep level of pain or brokenness. But we're coming here with our whole selves. And I've heard... Some of you say, like, I was afraid to come to church because I was afraid of being judged or I came in feeling shame. But something that I think is really beautiful is that they said we experienced love and welcome instead of judgment. That is an incredibly beautiful thing. And I think, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, like, that's what they got from me. They're saying that's what they got from you guys. Like, that's what they experienced from you guys. So thank you for showing Jesus love and in some ways, like, in a, in a profound way as you can. And I see some of these people, and, you know, they, they maybe were doing things, living a life that, that was causing all sort of, like, messes. Uh, but then having met with, Having, having been, been met with love here and having experienced Jesus here, what we're seeing is like the fruit of the Spirit in them. 
like the qualities of Jesus starting to flow out of their life. Peace, joy, faithfulness, self-control. And it's so cool to walk with some of you as you go on this journey of life transformation. But beauty and truth. This series uh, is going to take us through John. And I, I was too ambitious when I, we made this graphic. It's not actually a journey through the whole book of John. I started to read through the whole book and I thought, man, I can't do this in in a month or two. Uh, So we're just going to be looking at the last few chapters of John, John 13 to 17. This is Jesus' farewell speech. But as we do this, uh, and as we talk through beauty and truth, I think that there's a different invitation depending on, again, where you're coming from or what your background is. So I realized this week that really for the first 30 years of my life, I was very focused on truth on the truths that Jesus maybe proclaimed. I was drawn to the truth, you know, theology and intricacies of of what the Bible teaches. And now God is inviting me into an experience of his beauty over the last couple of years. And that's probably true for some of you in this room, right? You've You've been all about Jesus' truth. And guys, truth is important but he's inviting you into something new. He's inviting you to experience his beauty. Uh, On the other hand, some of you have been drawn to Jesus' beauty, uh, to his life, to his his teaching, uh, to his person, because Jesus is beautiful. And during the series, Jesus might be inviting you into a deeper understanding of truth. So, I think, I think there's something kind of for everybody as we go through here. Uh, but this, this John 13 to 17, uh, as, as it says there, is Jesus' farewell speech. And I find this really interesting. And it might just be because I'm a Bible nerd. But Jesus' farewell speech is obviously important. Like if you're thinking like somebody's going to leave or die or, or depart, like their last words carry a certain weight to it. Am I right? You might pay attention to somebody's last words. And, and it's true of different people in Jesus' like, world, in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, like if a philosopher dies or if a politician dies, what is said is said in a specific like, order or a specific, like there are certain topics that everybody hits. Um, so you see this even in like Moses' death. When Moses dies, he goes through a certain progression of topics. And if you want to go deeper into that, uh, you could just read the book of Deuteronomy. That's basically Moses' farewell speech. But whether you're Plato or whether you're Aristotle or whether you're Moses or whether you're the great master Yoda, when you are facing death, there's a certain like, checklist of things you want to talk about. And you'll see this in these chapters, John 13, to 17. So the first, one of the first things Jesus does is he declares that I am going to die and my death is imminent. Just as Yoda says in his final scene, soon I must rest, forever sleep. Another thing that happens is uh, there's a comfort that's offered. And if you have your Bibles open to John 13 to 17, you could probably even kind of see like, oh yeah, I see there Jesus, one of the headings in my Bible is Jesus comforts his disciple or his disciples. So Yoda does the same thing. Number three, Uh, There's certain warnings that Jesus gives. Number four, there's a passing on of wisdom, right? That's actually most of the content of this final speech or this final quote-unquote act before Jesus is led to die. Number five, they name a successor. Yoda says, Luke, when gone I am, the last of the Jedi, you will be. Will you be? And Jesus names a successor as well. And I think it's really interesting. I would encourage you to read John uh, 13 to 17. It really stuck out to me like who Jesus is sending as his successor. It might not be what you expect. Um, It was, just take a look. We'll get there eventually, but today's not the day, not the week. Uh, Finally, uh, there's a blessing or a prayer. So whether you're, like I said, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Moses, And now Jesus is sending essentially his disciples out with a blessing or a prayer to to close things down. Okay, so uh, the content of this big 
selection of passage. You'll notice if you read, and I would encourage you to read it uh, over the next couple of months, a few times, there are certain themes that start to emerge. In fact, not just themes, but words that get repeated. Sometimes repeated so often that you start to get dizzy. Like how many times can you say the word glory in a sentence, Jesus? Has anyone here read the book of John? Like you start to spin. But there's, uh, there's other themes that bubble up to the surface too that come up over and over again, like truth and faith or trust, or knowing. It's amazing how often Jesus talks about knowing or being known, uh, knowing God's will, knowing God, knowing him, knowing truth. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned glory already, but I think a good definition of glory for our context is beauty. So to be glorified is to have like the, your beauty on display or your beauty acknowledged or, or, or appreciated or to sit in somebody's beauty like is a, is a form of like glorification. And then love, of course, because we're talking about Jesus and that is at the heart of Jesus' message is to love God uh, as well as love people. And uh, you're not just to love people generically, but to love people as you love yourself, right? So loving yourself is an important part of that. And as I was thinking about how love works, I was thinking that really most things that we love, have you thought about this? Why do you love something? Most things that you love, you love because they are either beautiful or because they are true. So I think love becomes like a connecting ligament for this series of beauty and truth. The, it's beauty that like stirs up our desires or it's truth that draws us to something or someone. So what I want to do today before we read from John 13 is I want you to think about a time you experienced great beauty in your life. Think about a time that you experienced great beauty. And what I want you to do is I want you to find somebody near you. It's actually, it's okay if this is somebody that you know. It's fun to, to find someone behind you maybe that you don't know or in front of you. Uh, but for 30 seconds, I want one of the individuals to share either about that experience and give some details and then, uh, or, or like share a, a couple of different things that come to mind when you think about uh, experiences of great beauty. And then after 30 seconds, we'll switch. Does that sound good? All right, go. Okay, it's time to switch. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. Time's up. Okay, there's a good chance that this is going to be one of the questions on the life group study. So you'll have an opportunity to share this with more people if you're in a life group or to hear from more people if you're in a life group. Uh, but I want to just kind of some, some, somebody yell out something that, that came to mind when you thought about great beauty. Nature, the first time I saw my wife, the beautiful Louise. Over here. Your child, the birth of your child. Your first one or your second one? I'm kidding. <laughs> Who else? Sunsets, some people love sun sunsets. 
Wedding days, the Grand Canyon, good and specific. The beauty of Jesus, very good. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Has anybody experienced that? You don't know what people are talking about until it happens to you. It's this like crazy thing. Uh, maybe come forward for prayer later. Maybe it'll happen to you. Uh, did you raise your hand? No? Eagle Super Bowl is a beautiful thing. I, uh, I, I saw this on Facebook. You know Nick Foles is still the last quarterback to throw a touchdown in the Super Bowl? Isn't that something? That's pretty great. Okay, I want to I actually describe to you something beautiful that happened to me. And the interesting thing about the moments of beauty that come to mind is it's not like a, it's not a snapshot. There are experiences, right, that have a beginning, middle, and end. And so I think this was the year 2007. I was in Glacier National Park. Christian Ministry in the National Parks is like this organization where they, they make you preach in amphitheaters or talk do worship services in amphitheaters, and then they make you work during the week. And I worked as a waiter. Um, I found out somebody else did that here recently. That guy right there did that in Glacier National Park. But uh, it was four in the morning. We woke up. It was dark. And we went on this hike up uh, Logan's Pass. And just show that first picture. Can you see that? Yeah, we couldn't see anything either because <laughs> it was four in the morning. Uh, but something started to happen, of course, is in, in that uh, the light started to come in. And what you can, could see then, which you can only see sort of right now, is these thousand little slivers of silver light, which, was the, which were the streams being formed by the snow that was melting on the mountain. And so the next uh, fade, the, you know, the sun, of course, starts to rise. And you can see a little bit more. Next slide. Uh, as it comes up, you can start, see the ridge, start seeing the ridges in the mountain in the next slide. Uh, it, things start to get brighter in the next slide. And, and you see this like glorious triple waterfall uh, on the top of this mountain. And it was one of the most beautiful things that I have ever experienced. And it, it, it really actually choked me up a little bit looking at these pictures from, did I say 2011? Seven? Seven? 2007, like... 10, 11 years ago. Um, I'll t I want to show you another beautiful thing that happened in my life. Uh, next picture, please. Yeah, that. Uh, the, uh, they have these like grimaces on their face, which is kind of funny, actually, but it's sweet, too. <laughs> so, so uh, of course, this is my wedding day, and uh, I'm up on the stage, because I'm, you know, that's where the groom is. And everybody's looking at Allison, except for Allison and her dad, who are looking at me. And uh, afterward, uh, Allison's dad said to me, you know, I've never had a murderous thought about you until that moment. <laughs> and he said, it's because uh, I was keeping it together. I was fine. I walked into the, you know, the sanctuary that, where the wedding was happening, and I looked at you, and you were crying. And it made me cry, too. <laughs> and you can see that kind of Allison is, is doing the same thing, like just trying to hold it together emotionally. But like... I think it's a natural thing, and this is what I was doing. In the, in the presence of beauty, there's this overwhelming emotional response, which makes me leak. Like, I, I, I get teary. And I, I imagine that that's an experience that some of you have had too. And, and maybe it's when you've been watching nature, or maybe it's you're watching a movie or reading a book. Uh, do you, have you ever tasted anything beautiful? Chocolate. Uh, Ed, Ed, off the top, I'm putting Ed on the spot here. He's our sommelier, wine expert. Have you tasted like a truly beautiful wine? 67 Auvignon Blanc. A 67 Auvignon, Auvignon Blanc. How many times have you had it? Once. One time. Can you describe the flavors? Oh, yeah, it was mineral, lemon curd. Mineral, lemon curd. Uh, and it was alive. I mean, this was 1992. It was, it was a living wine in 1992. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like, we can remember these beautiful moments, a glass of wine. And, and I actually think it's, there's not just beautiful things to see or beautiful things to hear or beautiful things to taste. There are actually beautiful people in our life. I, I want you for just a second to think of a beautiful person. A beautiful person that you know. And now I want you to think of adjectives to describe that person. How would you describe that person in one or two or three words? 
Let me hear. Genuine. Warm. Kind and warm. Sincere, Sincere and giving. Loving. Loving and humble. And cheerful and like Jesus love. Powerful. Smart. Are, who are we talking about here? <laughs> no, this is, this is good, right? You can think of beautiful people and the characteristics of those beautiful people and the way that those people are. And so keeping this idea of beauty in your mind and the idea that Jesus is about to go to his death, I want you to hear from John 13. And Jesus doesn't actually start his farewell speech with words. He starts his farewell speech with an action. He does something. As far as I know, this is unique in the farewell speech genre. Instead of beginning by, by speaking, he does what happens in John 13, verse 1. It says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon, Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return from God. I'm going to pause right there. Right? Jesus hasn't said or, or done anything. The narrator is just kind of describing the scene. And it's interesting that in this moment, John is reminding us that Jesus had come from the Father and that God had given him authority over everything. He had come from God and would return to God. It's like John is, is bringing to mind the opening of this book. Some of you know John 1 pretty well. It begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Uh, in describing who Jesus was, right? The creative force behind everything beautiful in this world is Jesus. He created everything. He has been given authority over everything. If you can imagine any greater person or any greater being, like, there's, it's Jesus. He is the greatest being the greatest person, the creator of all beauty. So John brings that to mind. And then he says this in verse four. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. This is a beautiful action. It's a humble act of service. Remember how my slipper smelled bad? This doesn't compare to how bad and dirty and gross the disciples' feet would have been. It's the Middle East. It's dusty. It's dry. It's the first century. There's animals in the roads, right? Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to walk down 401 in sandals. But imagine, uh, and this actually, this happens from time to time, like if, if there were cows that got out on the road and left their presence for everybody to drive through and only there's no driving, you're just walking. Uh, imagine the disciples' feet. Um, in fact, this was such a, a humble act or such a, a, in some ways, a shocking act that Jesus, the host, right, the, the honorable rabbi would get down on his feet because uh, in some municipalities at that time, you were not allowed to command a slave to wash somebody's feet. It was like a social justice issue because it was so demeaning, because it was so low. They wanted to make sure that the person washing the feet at the party was getting paid. And Jesus, who is the creator of everything beautiful, takes a towel, gets down, at the level of his disciples' feet with a basin, rubbing his hands around their toes and taking off the dirt and the sludge that would have been there, is saying something about what true love looks like. Is saying something about what true beauty is. He's saying something symbolic that will not just give meaning to this farewell speech, 
but gives meaning to his death, his voluntary death, where he not only comes down from heaven to become a human, as a human goes down to his disciples' feet, but as the Savior of the world goes into the ground and dies for each of us. And I, I can barely put this to words, how important this moment is, how deeply profound Jesus' action has gone on to shape how Christians live, how followers of Jesus uh, live out their lives. But I, I've been listening to this podcast, um, and this only, kind of, this only relates um, peripherally to, to this text, but uh, it's called The Ferment, and some of you maybe remember Adam Russell. I don't know if I actually spelled his name right now that I'm looking at it. I think there's an extra L in there. Yeah. Uh, he's the director of In Your Worship. He was here about a year ago for our whole conference, our wholeness conference. Do you remember that? Uh, but he's, he's here in this clip. He's talking to Michael Gatlin, who I have a ton of respect for. And, and he's saying something, Michael Gatlin is saying something about what drew him to Jesus initially. And I think, uh, I think this little passage, this little deed by Jesus is a great example of how the beauty of Jesus can capture our hearts. So uh, can we get this clip to play? So early on, the thing that drew me to Jesus as a 17-year-old was how beautiful he was. Like, that's the thing, when I reflect back, that's the thing that captured my heart. His logic was beautiful. His life was beautiful. Like, the way he lived, like, there's never been a more beautiful life on the planet. And his death was this beautiful act of redemption where he involves me, he draws me into that. And so it's like the beauty to me is just absolutely Drop dead, gorgeous, breathtaking beauty. That's what draws drew me in. Yeah, this like um, I think that's the root of what we might consider to be the truest Christian aesthetic, right? Yeah, like it's the beauty of God. Yeah, uh, to use your words, even like the beauty of Jesus is logic. Yeah, the beauty of his teaching, the way he interacted with people, those who agreed with him, and those dis- there's like it's, it's like it's so beautiful. And then the, the ultimate though is the cross, which is the ultimate paradox, oh right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like the ugliest thing in the world. Yeah, turned into the most beautiful, welcoming thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the role of the artist, yeah. and it's the old, it's the role of the church planter or the exactly. pastor or That's the church exactly in general, right? right? Yeah. Like we're recycling. I think Brian Zahn says that we're recycling the world's ugliness or Jesus through God. God through Jesus has recycled the the yeah, pain and the sin good. and the ugliness of yeah. the world, and He's made it into something. Yeah, beauty. Yeah, that's amazing so good he says the role of the church is to like recycle the pain in the world and turn it into something beautiful Uh, and and maybe the most like kind of amazing turns and there is they, they just say something briefly about how ugly the cross was and how ugly really all death is, and how Jesus alone was able to turn that into something truly beautiful that he offers to each of us. I'm going to keep reading here in uh, John 13. He's washing the disciples' feet in verse 5. And then in verse 6, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Um, Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replies, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet, Jesus replies, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean. Uh, He goes on to talk about Judas there. But uh, it's interesting how Jesus is doing this great humble act of service. Uh, the, The great example of love symbolically pointing to the cross, right, which becomes the grid through which Peter will later understand the meaning of what Jesus is doing when he washes his disciples' feet. 
But he doesn't understand that yet because like, Jesus hasn't died yet, hasn't raised, been raised from the dead yet. Uh, and so Peter refuses in his pride, right? And then, in a sense, I actually think that when Jesus, when Jesus says, no, you must have your feet washed, Peter says, then wash me everywhere, right? Where's that coming from? I think it's, again, from his pride. Or at least that's how it would be for me. Like, I would at first be prideful and saying, like, no, Jesus, I'm not going to let you serve me. I, you know, let me serve you, which can be out of pride. And then when Jesus basically calls him out on it and says, no, you're wrong, right? Of course, prideful people don't like to be wrong. And so then he goes full force the other way. So when his pride says, you know, wash my head and my hands and, you know, my whole body. And Jesus again says, essentially, like, no, you don't understand. Like your pride has once again gotten in the way of letting me serve you and transform you. And as I was thinking about beauty and, again, how we all engage with beauty or maybe don't engage with beauty, I think pride is, interestingly, one of those things that, that is a real issue for many of us and actually inhibits our ability to experience beauty. Not just Jesus' beauty, but beauty in the world. And I'm just, let me explain why I think that. Because as prideful people, we what? What do we think about most of the time? We think about ourselves. As we think about ourselves, right, and, and only ourselves, we, we forget to notice what's going on around us, the people around us, uh, the food around us, the nature around us. Like, I, I'm a millennial, and so, like, we are, we're very interested in our own experiences, right, which we can confuse for an experience of beauty. Like, uh, sometime in my 20s, I went from like experience to experience to experience and I actually got like burnt out on experience. But I, I realized I wasn't actually sitting in beauty and, uh, and celebrating it. I was actually doing all this for myself so it got like dull. But the, the nature of beauty, and I think maybe the nature of truth too, is that beauty draws us out of ourselves. And so if we are self-absorbed, if we think we have our lives together, if we think we have all the answers, if Jesus comes to us and says, let me wash your feet, we're going to put our guards up and say, no, I don't need any help. If you have trouble letting people serve you or help you or even compliment you, I mean, it might be low self-esteem, but it might be your pride getting in the way. And I think that's what Jesus wants to remind Peter uh, here, that, that there, there's actually a need to receive. I'm just going to jump down and read a question from verse 12, and then we'll stop. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked do you understand what I was doing? That's my question to you guys today. Do you understand what Jesus was doing here for his disciples? Do you understand what Jesus wants to do for you today, even, as we're going to transition into worship here in just a second? What does Jesus want to do for you? Do you understand it? You know, we call, we call this, this thing, not, not the circle, but like what we do on Sundays, what do we call it? We call it a worship service. Let me ask you, who's being served? Who's doing the serving, right? So I think a lot of times we think of this as being like, yeah, we're coming to maybe serve people because we help out in the cafe. Uh, that's true to, to like a degree, and we're serving the kids if we work out in the kids' wing. We're serving the gr you know, this group of people if we're on the, the band. Uh, or maybe we're serving God, right? It's a worship service because we come and we serve God. But that's actually, we've flipped it around. Like first and foremost, and most importantly, we call it a worship service because when we come, Jesus wants to serve us. 
He wants to serve you. He wants you to experience his greatness and his love. He wants you to feel the effects of like his death on the cross, but more than that, uh, the life that comes out of that death because of his resurrection. Do you understand what I was doing? Do you understand that the ugliness of the cross was turned into beauty because Jesus touched it? Do you understand that the ugliness of your life can be transformed, not, not erased, but transformed into something beautiful? Your weakness can be made perfect in his strength. Do you understand what I was doing? Jesus is asking you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. It is an amazing act of humble service that you would come and wash your disciples' feet 2,000 years ago. It's a captivating act of beautiful love that you would come today, 2,000 years later, and be willing to serve us from wherever we're coming, whoever we are, whatever we've done. So Holy Spirit, come. We invite you into this moment. It is a great service to us to be able to gaze on your beauty. Thank you for loving us. We now turn our hearts to you. In Jesus' name.